Now, so how are we going to do, uh, how are we going to estimate uh, the conditional average streaming effect? Obviously, you can use a variety of uh, machine learning algorithms to do this. And so what we're going to do is look at the different type, um, different strategies of estimating the conditional average streaming effect. The first thing uh, I'm going to look at is called S-Learner. S-Learner uh, uses uh, a single model to estimate this conditional expectation function of y given t and x, okay? so mu t. Now, I'm assuming that treatment is uh, ignorable conditional on x here. Okay? In the randomized experiment, that's uh, readily uh, applicable. Uh, in the observational studies, you have to assume that x includes all the confounding variables. Okay, so the s runner uh, is going to use a single model to estimate this conditional ex expectation function. Once you have that, you just uh, plug in t equal 1 and t equal 0, and then compute the difference uh, between the two uh, at each value of x. Okay? So that's how you estimate the conditional streaming effect using the s runner. What this means is that you have to model interactions between the treatment and the covariates, how they interact, right? Because you're gonna hold the x constant and then you change the t from zero to one and then take the difference, okay? And this can be challenging. In particular, um, often the interaction have a much weaker signal than the main effects. So for example, if you just naively uh, run the Russell regression, um, oftentimes the interaction terms will be reduced to zero and you don't uh, detect uh, you know, heterogeneity. So, so that's um, one challenge of this s uh, but it's a simple way of doing this, like using single model to estimate the con conditional restriction effect. Alternatively, you can use something called t-learner. t-learner is gonna estimate the conditional expectation function separately for each group. So what this means is that you're gonna um, fit the machine learning model to the treatment group and the control group separately. And then compute the difference between the two. Okay. So instead of using a single model with instructions, here T-learner would um, do a separate model for the treatment group and control group and then take the difference. So that's good, but the difficulty might be that if the treatment assignment is lopsided, so the one group is particularly small, then um, the fitting the model separately might not be very efficient. And uh, another possible problem might be that um, even though uh, you can control, um, you know, smoothness, the regularization for treatment group and control group separately, the difference might be um, not really smooth. So the average conditional average treatment effect function itself, the estimated uh, Kate function may be, um, you know, pretty zigzaggy, for example, uh, even though each one, the mu1 and mu0, is smoothly estimated. So that's sort of the di potential disadvantage of t learner. Although it's sort of easy to, you know, you don't have to worry about interactions uh, like s runner because you fit the trimming and control group, you fit the model separately, um, because the each model is trained differently on a different data set. Uh, the, di the difference between mu, mu1 hat and mu0 hat may not be um, well calibrated. The third strategy is, some is something called the x learner. Uh, x learner uh, is, is like t learner. First step is to estimate the conditional expectation function separately for each group. But unlike t-learner, where you just uh, compute the difference between mu1 hat and mu0 hat, the x-learner only uses this uh, model to impute the missing potential outcomes. Okay? So if you, if you are um, trying to estimate the treatment effect um, for the treated unit, you would use the observed outcome as y of 1, and then only impute the y of 0, which is not uh, observed, and then take the difference. And that gives you the estimate of uh, individual uh, trimming effect 
tau i. Okay? And then we can, once we compute the tau i hat, that's the your estimated individual treatment effect, then you use another model uh, to um, figure out the relationship between tau i hat and x. Right? So the idea is to use the mo first fit the model separately for each group, and then use those models to impute the potential outcomes, which gives you the estimate of the individual treatment effect. And then use those individual treatment effect, uh, model that individual treatment effects using X uh, um, by another machine learning algorithm. So that's the X learner. Um, so this tends to be more robust because you're using the observed outcome instead of imputing the both like T learner. Um, but it tends to less efficient because you have, uh, you know, model separately estimated for each group, and then you're using another model to uh, figure out the relationship between uh, individual treatment effects and uh, covariate values x. So these are the three sort of standard uh, ways of using uh, different machine learning algorithms to estimate conditional average treatment effect. Now let's look at the, uh, let's discuss a couple of examples. So one possible um, use, you know, one, one type of machine learning algorithm that people often use is a penalized maximum likelihood estimator. Penalized maximum likelihood estimator is just the usual maximum likelihood estimator, but it has the penalty, P uh, of lambda and uh, theta, as written in field. So for example, one example is a rigid regression which has a penalty of coefficient square. Another you know, well-known example is the lasso, which has L1 uh, penalty for the coefficients. We have to do some sample splitting in order to avoid the um, overfitting. So what you usually typically do is you're going to have a training data where you estimate the theta, in, in most cases, uh, coefficients, given this lambda, lambda is a tuning parameter that controls how much regularization that you're going to impose. Okay. And you're going to have a test data, and often this is done by cross-validation, to choose the optimal amount of regularization that you want to impose um, on, the, on the estimation. Okay. And then finally, you're going to have the validation data to estimate the Kate given this choice of um, lambda, and um, uh, you know, you're going to use this validation data to re estimate the, uh, uh, the model parameters and estimate the conditional average stream effect. So, what this requires is that you're going to have to split the data into um, three portions one is to train the model. And another is to test the data, um, test the model, and then the last one is to validate the model. Okay. So it's it's data data intensive um, in order to avoid the overfitting. Now, uh, uh, back in 2013, I I applied the S learner uh, using the RASO uh, type of constraint with a four vector machine. And we used the separate tuning parameters, uh, so there's a two lambdas for main terms and interactions separately. So the reason why we had to do that is because if we just use one lambda parameter um, for both main terms and interaction terms, it tends to be the case that many of the interaction terms goes to zero and you don't really pick up uh, any uh, heterogeneity. And, but this led to the two-dimensional research, which uh, increased the computational uh, intensity. Now, another example is T-Learner, uh, which was used by Huyan and Murphy uh, back in 2011. And they used the RASO uh, with three squares. And they separately fitted uh, the RASO with three squares for the trimming and control groups. And then, um, but when the trimming has more than two categories, so the, in the binary case, they used the T-Learner. But um, the cases where the treatment has more than two categories, 
they use the S learner that is the fit the single model with the Lasso constraints. Okay, so these are the sort of uh, examples you can look at um, how people use the penalized maximum likelihood estimator to um, to estimate the conditional average streaming factor. Now here is the output application from my paper back in 2013. So we had in this paper we had a 44 covariates including some square and interaction terms. Uh, there's also 44 interactions between the treatment and, and these covariates. So there are 44 main terms and 44 interaction uh, treatment and covariate interactions. And uh, we placed the uh, uh, Russell constraint on this. The outcome was whether um, the wages uh, was increased or not, so the binary outcome. And this was a job training uh, program, experimental job training program, and we had a large number of covariates. Um, the sparsity, so because we used the lasso constraints, which means that many of the coefficients will be reduced to zero, which helps you with the interpretation. So one of the difficulty of estimating the conditional average streaming effect is that you want to be able to uh, interpret what type of people are more likely to be treated and what type of people are, you know, uh, what type of people are more likely to benefit from the treatment and what kind of people are being harmed by the treatment. So you want to figure that out. And when you use a very complex black box machine learning algorithm, you'll be able to sort the different profiles, different individuals with different characteristics from you know, high um, estimated conditional average streaming effect to low, you'll be able to sort them, but it's, it's hard to understand why some people are listed high and you know, why some people are predicted to have negative effects. The sparsity, like if you use the penalized uh, maximum likelihood methods, the sparsity means that many of the parameters are going to be reduced to zero. So the final model is relatively low dimensional. So you can have a better sense of um, what the uh, who, who are benefiting from the treatment. Whereas if it's super complicated, say neural nets, you might have a hard time interpreting uh, the outcome, even though the model will sort people's characteristics based on their predicted, the magnitude of the estimated condition of extreme effect. In any case, so here is the table from the paper. So here we um, listed a couple of sort of people who got positive, you know, who are according to our method, are predicted to have a positive effect. And then there are type of profiles of the workers who predicted have negative effects, that is um, potentially negatively affected by this job, job training program. And, and you can see like for the, uh, the profile of the workers who are uh, estimated to have positive effects, you see that a lot of them have, uh, you know, unemployment status, so they weren't, uh, Unemployed. They were un un unemployed, um, and even among the ones who are employed, uh, they don't have a high school degree, and they tend to be single. Many of them uh, tend to be uh, either black or Hispanic, and so you can uh, you can sort of get a sense. Uh, it's still difficult because you're just sort of listing different profiles from. Um, estimated high conditional average stream effect to low, but you can get some sense uh, because of this, uh, the regularization, you can get some sense of what type of factors are contributing to the estimation of positive conditional average stream effect. If you look at the negative conditional average stream effect, all the profiles have no unemployment, that is everybody is employed and they're much higher earnings than the, um, uh, those profiles that are predicted to have um, low, uh, the positive effects. And um, there are, um, many of them have high school degrees and so on. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, uh, 
the regularized uh, machine learning methods um, help you characterize uh, who tend to benefit uh, from the treatment and who tend to be negatively affected by the treatment. Another popular te technique uh, is the classification and regression trees, or CART. Um, CART is, the reason why the CART is popular is it's flexible and interpretable. And so back in 2011, I used the CART and used the T-learner. So I fitted the CART to the achievement group and control group separately using the get out the boat uh, experiment to its text messaging as a treatment. And so it's T learners, so the um, uh, two models, uh, two cart models are fitted separately for the treatment and control. And then you can see that um, the first thing that the classification and regression trees uh, do a split is the age um, around the 25 years old uh, for the control group, and um, interestingly, much younger. 19, uh, about 20 years old for the control group, uh, for the treatment group. And then also it looks, uh, look at the log population density, um, essentially sort of looking at whether people live in the city or in uh, suburb or rural areas. So these are the sort of um, the variables and spreads that uh, class cart uh, classification and regression trees picked up. Um, so because it's a tree structure, it's relatively um, easy to interpret the number at the bottom of the, each uh, leaf, end of the tree uh, spreads are the uh, turnout probabilities. So you can see um, among, you know, the each, each group has different turnout. And since this is a T-learner, uh, one model is fitted to the treatment group and another model is fit to the control group, in order to estimate the con uh, condition of the effect, you have to take a difference of the two for each individual and, and in, in each individual profile. Um, people have used this type of tree methods uh, for as an S runner. So instead of here, um, like here, fitting the tree models separately, to the tree and control group, uh, they fit the one single tree um, in the um, in, the whole, in uh, to the entire entire data set. Um, and in this uh, paper by AC and Invents, they target uh, minimizing the mean square of estimating the conditional average stream effect rather than mean square of prediction, so that um, you know the the choice of like how much do you grow the tree depends on the mean square, minimizing the mean square of the conditional average tree effect, estimating the conditional average tree effect rather than the usual um, uh, predicting the outcome. Here again, you have to do some, some kind of three-way sample splitting in order to avoid the overfitting. So the one you use the one uh, sample to grow a tree and then another sample to prune the tree, and then you use the final sample to estimate the K in the, each of these leaves, uh, you know, what the outcome, average outcome is within each, uh, each leaf of the tree. Okay. So just like um, the penalized maximum likelihood situation, it's a very data intensive, um, you have to estimate uh, use the three-way split, sample splitting, in order to avoid the overfitting. Um, the extension of this condition, uh, classification regression trees uh, is a random forest. So recently, the uh, Warger and AC used the random forest to estimate the causal heterogeneity. And the random forest um, doesn't rely on just a single tree it relies on a large number of trees. Uh, obviously, the uh, advantage is that it's much more flexible than the classification regression trees, which only has one tree. The disadvantage is that random forests tend to be hard to interpret. 
um, you get, you know, you can again like um, sort the uh, all the profiles or the characteristics of X based on the estimated condition of a student effect, but it might be difficult to understand like what factors are contributing um, to the heterogeneity and um, regularized regression method that I discussed earlier, the Russell type of methods, uh, might be a little bit easier uh, in terms of uh, interpreting the, the results you obtained.